As you're finding your seat, I would invite you to find your place in your Bible to Revelation chapter 3. We are continuing our study of this magnificent book. And what I hope is proving to be a helpful section of this book, these seven letters to seven churches, comprising chapters 2 and 3, they give us a window into Jesus' personal, sovereign care for His church. We find ourselves this morning studying Jesus' letter to the church at Philadelphia. I grew up with earthquakes. They were something of a frequent occurrence in Alaska in my childhood. And earthquakes are unnerving and unsettling. Of course, the ground shakes beneath you and and everything that felt stable, everything that was secure, everything that just sort of was normal, staying in one place, all of a sudden is not. And furniture jumps around. And, and of course, there are various types of earthquakes. I've experienced the rolling sort where my friend and I were throwing a football in the front yard and he fell down seconds before I did. We didn't understand what was happening in the undulation of the earth. Those of you who were in Southern California in the giant Northridge quake experienced the liquefaction of the earth where what felt like solid ground turned to liquefying action. Buildings crumbled. Houses could not be lived in anymore. And for our friends in Papua New Guinea whose houses were flattened, the emotional effects of earthquakes remain. In fact, I found that aftershocks are worse than the initial quake because the initial quake sets you on edge And an aftershock brings to reminder what was so recent in your memory with all the added fears of this one could be the big one. Is this one worse? What's going to happen next? And I remember after a significant earthquake having the effect of any little tremor. It could have just been indigestion. (laughs) Sparked fears that the walls would come down. An immediate departure from indoors to out of doors. You you just run to open spaces to find places where things will not fall on you. And if you haven't lived in earthquake country, you might sympathize just a little bit with the reminder that that cell phone in your pocket or your purse buzzes, makes noise when, when you get a call or a text message. And I've had the experience of not having my phone anywhere near me, and my leg vibrates, and I wonder, oh, who's calling me? And and there's no phone anywhere. Did a fly land on my leg? Am I so hypersensitive? And the feeling of aftershocks is something like that. Any little movement, any little shake just sets on edge those fears and anxieties. I would suggest to you that our culture today feels something like that earthquake with aftershocks. It seems every time you open the newspaper, every time you pull up the internet and you look at a headline, there is some new seismic change in culture, and you wonder what is going to fall next. What cultural norm will come crashing down? What walls will need to be buttressed again and rebuilt with much effort only to come crashing down in the next administration? And we sort of live in tumultuous times where the ground beneath us is unstable. I would suggest that the passage before us this morning gives us something of a recipe for living solid in an unsolid world. And the message is simply this to the church at Philadelphia, hold fast, hold fast. Let's read this letter from Jesus to this church in the first century, Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, he who is holy who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power. You have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause some of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie 
I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I love you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As the other letters we've looked at, this outline for this morning's sermon will follow the outline of the letter. There are six elements of Jesus' evaluation of the church at Philadelphia, a salutation, a commendation, a confrontation, a promise, a command, and a plea. We begin first with the salutation. This letter, again, is from Jesus and this time to the church at Philadelphia. And you can see again on the map, John is imprisoned on the island of Patmos off the coast of the Roman province of Asia Minor. That's circled in red. Uh, You can see where it is in relationship to the Mediterranean Sea and Jerusalem. And the city of Philadelphia is the sixth of seven cities in that circular postal route around this area. So we're in the the second to last of the churches, the second to last of the stops on this circular road, uh, the second to last assessment of churches from Jesus. Philadelphia was 30 miles southeast of Sardis. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. That is what the name means. Uh, The modern city of Philadelphia and its sports fans might betray the name. However, the original city was probably named after two brothers who were loyal to each other. There was pressure on one of those brothers to uh, glom on to the Roman Empire by betraying the brother. He refused that great pressure, monetary reward, and military prowess in order to be faithful to his brother. And so eventually the city became part of the Roman Empire, uh, but it did so under this banner of the city of brotherly love. That's where the city gets its name. The city was uh, a significant trade city built on a trade route, but it was built in what was known as the burned over district or burned out district. It, It was built in a highly volcanic area, and so many volcanoes were active in that day, and they had spewed out lava and eventually turned to rich volcanic soil that was perfect for vine growing, and so it was a a wine industry town that built much of its economy on growing grapes, on vines, for selling of wine. The soil wasn't good for growing other types of, of farming, but it was wonderful for vines. In 17 AD, there was a massive earthquake that shook the entire area, and it is likely that Philadelphia was at the epicenter. This earthquake was devastating. City walls crumbled, buildings collapsed. And then Philadelphia in particular, being so close to the epicenter and and surrounded by volcanic activity, was subject to regular aftershocks. In fact, few people stayed in the city. It became sort of a ghost town. Most people took up residence outside of the city, and, and, and almost instantaneously, this thriving trade city became an agrarian society dependent on those fields for vineyards just to survive. The people that remained in the city were engaged in a perpetual struggle to keep the walls up. Uh, They they would take the remains of buildings that had fallen down and and use those pieces to build back up their own domiciles. Uh, They would buttress the walls with supports, and, and they sort of lived in this temporary situation for decades. Everything was always under construction because the aftershocks would would bring what they had built back up down again. And so people didn't put out their nice things. They didn't finish out their homes. They just sort of lived in, in what could stand for a little while until it had to be rebuilt again. In addition to the geological upheavals that were natural to the city, there were political and economic upheavals. The emperor Domitian, who reigned during the time of these letters to these churches, in 92 AD, Domitian destroyed half of the agriculture surrounding the city of Philadelphia. You see, other parts of the Roman Empire were experiencing famine, 
And in order for the centralized planners of the Roman Empire to take care of that need, they decided to wipe out the vineyards of Philadelphia and force them to plant corn. Corn didn't grow in their soil. So Domitian single-handedly ruined their economy, making a city that was already in trouble and financial destitution worse. And what was true for the city, which had become small in size and then impoverished, was even more true for the Christians in the city. They were a small part of the population, and they were impoverished even more than the general populace of the city. The city of Philadelphia was on unstable ground, both literally and metaphorically. And Jesus writes to the city. Notice what he says in verse 7. To the church in Philadelphia, write, the one who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, says this. This is Jesus' introduction of himself in the salutation of the letter. And you remember that in all, all the other letters, Jesus appeals to something in that chapter one vision of Christ. He says something about himself from that first vision. And here, the description of Jesus does not come from chapter one. It comes from a, a conglomeration of references throughout the Old Testament. The first one is that Jesus is called the Holy One. This is a description of deity. God alone is holy in the way that is described here. You remember that the highly exalted view of God in Isaiah 6 is three times called holy by those sinless seraphim who call out God as holy. It means more than that God does not sin. It means he is fundamentally separate from everything that is created. And if you remember John's words in John 12, 41, speaking of Jesus, he says that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, before the incarnation, was the very one Isaiah was describing in Isaiah 6 as holy, holy, holy. You remember the demons in Jesus' earthly ministry cried out, I know who you are, you are the holy one. That is the Jesus who addresses this church here. He is also called true. That is genuine and faithful. He, he will not go back on his word. Philadelphia had been a city that had celebrated its loyalty to the empire. Uh, they contributed massive financial gifts uh, to celebrate emperors, to even rename their city after an emperor's wife because they were grateful for what the emperor had done to rebuild the city after the earthquake in 17 AD. But when Domitian destroyed their economy, they said, ah, oh, that's no good. Uh, we don't trust the emperor anymore. We don't trust the central planners of the empire. Uh, this was a betrayal of trust on Domitian's part. And, and for Jesus to be called true, to be genuine, to be faithful, would be one who would not go back on his word. He is trustworthy and reliable. And then Jesus says he is the one who possesses the key of David. David here is shorthand for the messianic kingdom. In chapter 1, Jesus was said to have the keys of death and Hades. Here, positively, he has the keys of life and salvation. Jesus is the one in charge of death and judgment, yes. But he's also the one in charge of all who will come into his glorious kingdom. He alone has the keys. And this is a contrast to the synagogue in Philadelphia. We'll talk about the danger of the synagogue as we progress through the letter. But the Jewish community there was hostile to the Christians. This was the fundamental problem of the relationship between Christians and Jews throughout Asia Minor. You see, Jews enjoyed the special protection under the Roman Empire. They were not required to worship the emperor or worship the, the pagan idols of the Roman pantheon. They got a special exemption because uh, the Roman Empire wanted to keep the peace and they knew that the Jews were a rebellious, rambunctious group of people. And so the best way to keep peace with the Jews was to give them an exemption from worshiping the empire or the pagan idols. But when the Jews said, Christians are not part of us, we don't like them. The fact that they call Jesus Messiah is offensive to us, so they're out of the synagogue. We are closing the doors of the synagogue to Christians. They cannot call themselves part of us anymore. And then Christians were exposed. They were exposed and liable to all the persecutions that came from the marketplace, from the temples of idolatry, and from the emperor himself who demanded to be worshiped as God on the earth. 
So because of the hostile Jewish community in Philadelphia, the Christians were liable to persecution. And so this is fascinating that Jesus says he is the one who possesses the key of David. Implicitly, not the synagogue. The synagogue does not decide who's in and who's out with God. No, Jesus, the true Messiah, decides that. He's got the keys. And then he says, he opens and no one shuts. And he shuts and no one opens. The local Jewish community might open the doors of the synagogue to whom they want, and they might shut the doors of the synagogue to Christians. But Jesus is the one who truly opens and shuts the doors for all who belong to him. This is a a welcome mat for those who depend on him in faith. This is language borrowed from Isaiah chapter 22, and I want you to turn there. We're going to spend a little time in Isaiah 22. And I want you to understand the language that Jesus uses here in verse 8 of Revelation 3. Isaiah chapter 22 depicts for us the time of Judah's king, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was a good king, did a lot of good things. He was faithful to the Lord for the most part. But Hezekiah was a king of Judah when the Assyrian Empire was amassed against the southern kingdom, had surrounded Jerusalem, and and all the cities on the outskirts of Jerusalem, all the way back to the Assyrian Empire, had fallen before Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And you may remember the scene where Sennacherib's henchman, a guy named Rabshakeh, that's a great name, trash-talked the city outside the walls. Do you remember the scene? Rabshak is out there and he's saying, where are the gods, and he names all the cities that fell, where are the gods of this city and this city and this city and this city? All those cities are fallen, and how do you think you could stand? In fact, Yahweh sent me to destroy you. And he's just giving them garbage over the wall. And you remember the scene, the, the people remained silent. And Hezekiah spread out the, the taunt letter before the Lord in prayer, and the Lord delivered them. And if you read further on in in Isaiah, you discover that Rabshakeh and Sennacherib's army stopped at Nob, a, a little village on the crest of the hill overlooking Jerusalem. It was an impossible situation for the, for the Jews in Jerusalem to withstand this mighty army. They did not have the armament, they didn't have the manpower, they had no resources to fight this battle. It, it was over. It was as if Rabshakeh had said, we killed everybody at the Alamo, now we're at the doorstep of Austin, and you can't stand in front of us. And then we discover that God stopped him right on the outskirts of Jerusalem where he could look down, even over the walls, into the city, and then because of a domestic disturbance back home, had to flee. And then he was chopped off, he was assassinated by his sons, and his reign was over. And God miraculously halted what was coming against Israel. Isaiah 22 gives us the lead up to those monumental events. Listen to this. The oracle concerning the valley of vision. What is the matter with you now that you all have gone up to the housetops? You who were full of noise, you boisterous town, exultant city. Your slain were not slain with a sword, nor did they die in battle. All your rulers have fled together. They've been captured without the bow. All of you were found, were taken captive together, though they had fled far away. Therefore I say, turn your eyes away from me. Let me weep bitterly. Do not try to comfort me concerning the destruction of the daughter of my people. For Yahweh, God of hosts, has a day of panic subjugation and confusion in the valley of vision, a breaking down of walls and a crying to the mountain. What you have here is a scene of Isaiah the prophet calling out to the people of Jerusalem. And it is a scene of confusion and panic and frantic people. And what's interesting here in Jesus' use of this in the letter to Philadelphia is a discussion of the breaking down of walls. We'll see uh, similar language that almost gives us the image of the the earthquake-stricken city of Philadelphia. And what's wrong with the people here? Uh, They have not trusted God. 
God has removed the defense of Judah. Look at verse eight. In that day you depended on the weapons of the house of the forest. You saw the breaches in the wall of the city of David were many. You collected the waters of the lower pool. You counted the houses of Jerusalem. You tore down houses to fortify the wall. You made a reservoir between the walls for the waters of the pool. What did they do? They, they turned to all their human innovations, human contrivances to solve their problem. What did they not do? Pray. Look at the second half of verse 11. But you did not depend on him who made it, nor did you take into consideration him who planned it long ago. God said he would bring Assyria to Israel as his implement for judgment. And Assyria was wicked. After Assyria was done doing God's bidding, Assyria would get judged for behaving wickedly. What was Israel's task? To trust the Lord, to entrust themselves to the Lord, to turn, to repent from the heart. I want you to notice what the people of Jerusalem were doing. Look at verse 12. Here's this call to repentance. The Lord God of hosts called you to weeping, to wailing, to shaving the head and to wearing sackcloth. Instead, there's gaiety and gladness, killing of cattle and slaughtering of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we may die. They went to the Epicurean party. Here the armies of the world are amassed against them, and they said, well, we got some steak here. We got some alcohol. Let's just live it up till it's over. That was not what God was calling them to. Verse 14, Yahweh of armies revealed himself to me. Surely this iniquity shall not be forgiven you until you die, says the Lord Yahweh of hosts. Look at verse 15. God brings about a change of leadership. Thus says Edonai Yahweh, the Lord Yahweh of armies, come, go to this steward, a manager, Shebna, who is in charge of the royal household. What right do you have here? Whom do you have here that you have hewn a tomb for yourself? You hew a tomb on the height. You carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. Uh, That's a reference to the, the privileged place of burial for those in honor. And God is saying, you're not honorable. You, you, you are a steward of the household of David, of the messianic line, of God's promises to Israel. Uh, you're in charge of the, the royal family, and, and you're not loyal to me. Behold, verse 17, Yahweh is about to hurl you headlong, O man. He's about to grasp you firmly, roll you tightly like a ball, to be cast into a vast country. There you will die. There your splendid chariots will be, the shame of your master's house. I will depose you from your office. I will pull you down from your station. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your tunic. I'll tie your sash about him. I will entrust him with your authority. And he'll become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. So this man named Hilkiah would come and actually give fatherly instruction to the royal household in Jerusalem during this time of crisis. He says, I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and he will be become a throne of glory to his father's household. So Hezekiah is the king. Hilkiah is over the Davidic household. He's he's a steward in the royal house. And God says he's going to place them there to give fatherly wisdom. And, And I'm not sure if Hilkiah had a significant influence in Hezekiah's life so that when the crisis came to the doorstep, Hezekiah prays to the Lord instead of relying on human innovations. What do we have at our own disposal to get us out of trouble, to to stabilize our lives? But Hilkiah was a stabilizing influence here called a, a firm peg driven by God to stabilize the people. In verse 25, we find out that this Uh, Peg driven in a firm place is merely temporary. Eliakim was not the final hope for Judah or for Jerusalem or for the nation of Israel. What's fascinating in Revelation chapter 3 in this letter to Philadelphia is Jesus 
is the one who for all time permanently possesses the key of David. And when he opens, no one can shut, and when he shuts, no one can open. This language is very specific in a way that Hilkiah stabilized the nation in a time of crisis, an unsettling time. Jesus himself here promises to stabilize and settle the hearts of the people, his people, in the church at Philadelphia during significantly unsettling times. And I hope you can see why Jesus appeals to this language as a comfort for his precious people in Philadelphia, whose houses are continually being torn down to rebuild walls, under whom the earth regularly shakes, who live under the unpredictable caprice of the tyranny of a Roman emperor. I don't know what's going to happen with the earth beneath me. I don't know what's going to happen in geopolitics around me. But Jesus is solid, and we can bank on him. That's how Jesus introduces himself in this letter. We come to the commendation in verse 8. In each of these letters, uh, what are you doing right? Jesus says, I know your deeds. And we're looking for the list of deeds. It doesn't come till later in the verse. Then there's this interruption. Behold, Jesus says, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. This parenthetical interruption is a, another assurance from Jesus that security in the Messiah's kingdom is for the, Philippian, or the uh, Philadelphian believers. When everything is unstable, you can count on this. I have opened the door to you to you who belong to me. Again, this was a contrast to the Jewish community who would shut them out, turn them out, vulnerable to persecution. And then Jesus, after this interruption, begins the list of deeds. And again, when Jesus says, I know your deeds, this is a comfort and an accountability simultaneously. When Jesus knows every believer in a church at the heart level, and he sees what no one else can see. It means, Christian, that when you live faithfully for him with no applause from the world, no appreciation, no alleviation of difficult circumstances, maybe no recognition from fellow believers, that is worship before the Lord that pleases him and Jesus sees and he knows. And what does Jesus see here? Probably in, in verse 8, the because should just be translated as a that. It's a continuation. I've no, I know your deeds. That, first of all, you have little power. You have little power. To our English ears, that kind of sounds like you're weak sauce. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying you're little and you're powerful. Now, basketball historians would remember the name Spud Webb. Okay, Spud Webb listed at five foot six and 133 pounds in the National Basketball Association. He had a long and illustrious career. He scored 8,072 points, averaging 9.9 .9 points a game. And in the 1986 slam dunk competition, he beat out Dominique Wilkins in the final with a 360 dunk. And just out of curiosity, I looked up, where is Spud Webb today? Well, you can find a video at 47 years old, still dunking. And he hasn't grown. Well, he's grown a little bit, but he's, he's still 5'6". <laughs> Spud Webb was a little power. He was little, but he was powerful. That, that's the meaning of the language here. You are a little power. You have little power. You are small by the world's estimations. Again, the city of Philadelphia itself has been decimated in its population, and the population of the church within it is smaller still, and yet they're powerful. They probably felt their littleness, and Jesus assures them of real spiritual power. And if you've been in a powerful earthquake, you have felt small. If you've been under persecution as a Christian, you have felt little. And Jesus assures this little church here that they have real power that the world and the emperor cannot touch. He says, additionally, you kept my word. And it's a simple past tense here. Uh, my English Bible translates it as uh, a perfect, you have kept my word. But, but a, Jesus here is looking back to a, a simple past event. Th there was a crisis that the Philadelphian church 
faced and met, and they were faithful. They kept Jesus' word, and, and the implication is there was temptation to go against the word, temptation to compromise, temptation to slip, temptations for unbelief, but they kept Jesus' word at a significant testing point. And then Jesus says, you did not deny my name. Again, a simple past tense there. Jesus is looking back at at an opportunity that the church had to accommodate to a hostile environment. Do you remember two weeks ago, we looked at that church at Sardis, and, and Sardis, Jesus called a dead church. They had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. And why was Sardis dead? Because they had caved in to the pressure from the synagogue, most likely. The Jewish synagogue says, you know, that stuff you're saying about Jesus being the Messiah, being God in the flesh, that's really offensive. Tone it down. Just call him a rabbi and we'll be good. We'll leave the doors open for you. And then you're not going to be persecuted by the Romans and the pagans. And the church at Sardis compromised with the world around them. The church at Philadelphia did not. Close your doors. We're calling Jesus Lord and God and Messiah. They were faithful. They did not deny his name. And then we could add the statement in verse 10, a little bit farther down to the commendation section. You have kept the word of my perseverance. Literally, again, a past tense. You kept the word of my perseverance. I believe this is a reference to Jesus calling his people to persevere, and you did it. You kept up my word of perseverance. You If we were to summarize this commendation, they they had spiritual power, obedience, loyalty, and endurance. And though they were insignificant in the eyes of the world, they experienced God's real power. When presented with opportunities to compromise, they kept God's word. When pressured to alter their message to accommodate the hostile culture around them, they did not conform. And in addition to all of that, they did it again and again and again. They persevered. They kept up in their faithfulness. In these letters, we we move from a commendation to a confrontation. But here, you notice, there is no confrontation from Jesus. Like the church at Smyrna, we we just move on. There's no section in this letter where Jesus says, I have these things against you. This is a 100% encouragement letter. And you remember the church at Smyrna was different than this church. The church at Smyrna was was promised a a significant time of trial and and difficulty and, and martyrdom and death. And Jesus told the church at Smyrna, be faithful unto death. Jesus gives the church at Philadelphia a different message. And that's just a helpful reminder. There There's no cookie-cutter approach from our Savior in these assessments. No two churches are alike. No two Christians are alike. Jesus' care of his people is personal, sovereign, compassionate, knowledgeable. So we move on to the promise in verses 9 and 10. Look down with me. Jesus says, Behold, I will cause some of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but they're not, they lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. This promise begins with what we could call evangelistic vindication. Evangelistic vindication. When Jesus says, I will cause some of the synagogue of Satan to come revere you, to to sit at your feet, I don't believe this is eschatological. This is not talking about the end times when when everyone, repentant or unrepentant, will bow before Jesus and confess that he is Lord. When when even Satan and his demons and and everyone who has chosen not to believe but to stiff-arm God will one day say under compulsion, Jesus is Lord. That day's coming, and in that day, every Jew, every member of every synagogue of Satan, every Gentile who has not believed will all compulsorily say, God's in charge. They will have to. They will not have eternal life. They will not be repentant, but they will be compelled to acknowledge his lordship. But here, Jesus is not talking about all of them bowing at Jesus' feet, but some of them, literally some out of the synagogue of Satan. They will come before your feet. I believe this is temporal. In the days of the church of Philadelphia, a select group out of the hostile Jewish community that will come to the feet 
of the believers in this city. This is evangelistic vindication. That is, this synagogue of Satan. Notice Jesus says, they say they are Jews, they are not, but they lie. Uh, What does that mean? Um, They're identifying genetically contrary to their biology? No, that's not what he's saying. This is a reflection of the truth, as Paul laid out in Romans 2, that a Jew is a Jew inwardly. A true Jew is a spiritual Jew. You might have circumcision on the outside, but unless you're circumcised of the heart, you are not spiritual Israel. He picks up this theme again in Romans 9, 6. Not all who are descended of Israel are Israel. There is a spiritual Israel within genetic or national Israel that we would call spiritual Jews. That means Jews who have the Holy Spirit, Jews born anew, born again Jewish people. That's what he means here. Those who are Jewish in heredity but living in unbelief having rejected Messiah are no friend of God. Now, God is faithful to save a remnant, and there's a remnant of believing Jews even amongst the church today. But in the days of Philadelphia, in the days of this church, the the Jewish community in town had risen up in hostility against those predominantly Gentile believers who said that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Now, listen to the language that Jesus uses here. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. You need to know that these are enemies that then come to the feet of believers in gratitude to let us know that even a synagogue of Satan is not out of the reach of the gospel. We should never think that somebody who is alive on this earth, still breathing, still with a heartbeat, no matter how hostile, no matter how often or persistent a fist is thrown in the face of God, that such a one is beyond hope of the gospel. So we pray and we proclaim good news to anyone that will listen and we see whom God will turn. Jesus here takes language from the prophet Isaiah and I'll read a verse from chapter 45 and from chapter 49 and chapter 60. And and God here is addressing the Jews, faithful Jews, amidst hostile Gentiles. And God promises that hostile Gentiles one day will actually come to faithful Jews and say, we love your God. Listen to these words. Thus says Yahweh, the products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabaeans, men of stature, will come over to you and will be yours. They will walk behind you. They will come. They will bow down to you. They will make supplication to you. Surely God is with you and there's no one else, no other God. Kings will be your guardians, their princesses your nurses. They will bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick the dust of your feet, and you will know that I am Yahweh. Those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing down to you. All those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of Yahweh, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And what's interesting about Jesus taking these these words from the prophet Isaiah that were designed to give faithful Israelites hope that their Gentile enemies will come and actually worship God with them get overturned here with the church at Philadelphia. Ironically, it's the Jewish synagogue that's hostile to God and the Gentiles that are believers. And in Philadelphia's day, their evangelistic hopes will be realized when hostile Jews will come and worship God at the feet of the Gentiles who were believers. This is tremendous encouragement for this little, powerful church. And the promise here extends not just to evangelistic vindication, but what we see in verse 10, exemption from tribulation. Exemption from tribulation. Look at verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is coming about the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. What is Jesus saying here? This is not an exemption from tribulation generally. Christians don't get exempted from tribulation generally. 
The Philadelphian church did not get exempted from tribulation generally. Jesus has in mind a specific tribulation, what the Bible calls the tribulation or even the great tribulation, which is coming about the entire earth. And Jesus promises personally to the church at Philadelphia, you will be exempted from that time. Basically, Jesus says, you already passed the test, you get to skip the final. The church at Philadelphia had passed the test of faithfulness. They were promised, therefore, not to participate in the worldwide period of testing that the book of Revelation details from chapter 6 to chapter 18. There you find the same phrase as those who dwell on the earth here eight times during that tribulation period in chapter 6 to 18. The earth dwellers are those who have aligned themselves with Antichrist against God. The earth dwellers is a technical term for those who are unrepentant during the time of the tribulation. And that is a period of global testing. Its, its goal is several fold, one of which is to purge national Israel, to cut off unbelief in Israel, but also to bring the remainder of Israel to repentance and faith, the fulfillment of Zechariah 12.10. They will look on Yahweh whom they pierced and they'll mourn for him as for an only son. They will mourn in repentance and faith. Israel en masse will believe the gospel during this period. It is the purpose of what Jeremiah 30 calls the troubling of Jacob. And this is a, a period of global testing, and this testing will produce results. It will cut off unbelief, and it will produce and refine faith. There will be believers, both Jews and Gentiles, during the tribulation. They just will not come from the church at Philadelphia, or by extension, faithful believers in the church age. There's a second issue that has to be addressed in this verse. What does it mean to be kept from the period of global testing of earth dwellers? There are two major views. One view says to be kept from the tribulation means to be preserved in it or to be preserved through it. And those who would deny a pre-tribulational rapture take that view. What Jesus means here is that, is that Christians will be preserved while they're enduring the tribulation. There are several problems with that. The, the grammar clearly says they will be kept out of it, that is, kept away from it in another place from where that tribulation is happening. Um, there, there's only one other place in the New Testament where that same verb and same preposition are used, and it's used in the same way that Christians will be kept out of the power of Satan. Even while they remain in the world, they're kept out of Satan's power. Here, believers are said to be kept out of the specific period of testing that's coming on the whole earth. Not preserved in it. There are other prepositions that could have been used. Jesus could have said, I will keep you in it, I will keep you through it. But he says, I will keep you out of it. Another indication that, that this is uh, a reference to the removal of the church prior to the tribulation is that there are martyrs during the tribulation period. It wouldn't mean much for Jesus to say, I'll keep you in it, but you're going to get your head cut off by the Antichrist. This is clearly a, a demonstration of Jesus' promise because of their faithfulness. They passed the test of faithfulness already. Now the meaning is they will be kept in a safe place away from where this very specific period of testing will occur. <clears throat> Revelation 3.10 does not mention the rapture. Right? There are three primary rapture passages in your Bible, John 14, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4. If you want to listen to an extended treatment of the pre-tribulational rapture in the Bible, I taught a three-part equipping hour series back in March and April of this year. You can go back and listen to that. And so while Revelation 3.10 does not describe the rapture, it does describe a promise from Jesus that the ch church will not participate in the tribulation, the implication of which is the church is removed prior to that tribulation. That's not a promise, by the way, that Christians will be uh, removed from trouble generally, uh, that Christians' destiny is to escape suffering and tribulation and trials and trouble and just live a peaceful, comfortable, happy life here. No, that is not at all the promise of Jesus. Quite the contrary. The slaves will not be counted greater than the master. If he suffered, we will suffer. 
But the promise from Jesus here is that the church would not suffer in that particular era designed for Israel and for the unbelieving world. That day is coming. We probably have reason to extend the promise here beyond the the church at Philadelphia, partly because Philadelphia was promised this and the tribulation hasn't come yet. And then secondly, because the way each of these letters closes, let him who has ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. God writes to the church at Philadelphia, but extends the messaging to Philadelphia to all the churches and to all who would hear in faith. There is a promise here from Jesus, not only for evangelistic vindication and exemption from the tribulation, but also for security of salvation. And we see that security in verse 12. Jesus says, to the one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven, and my new name. This is a a threefold application of security for the believers. First of all, he says, I will make you a pillar, strong, stable column, an unshakable feature in an imperturbable structure. To be a pillar in the temple of God means to be a, a strong, sturdy, immovable column in a building that will never be shaken by any force. There's nothing stronger than God's manifest presence. And he says, this will be in the new Jerusalem, that city that comes down out of heaven. And and you know the scene in Revelation 21 and 22. This is the eternal state, new heavens and new earth, and that city coming down out of the, the third heaven or the manifest presence of God down to the new earth. And if you read carefully in Revelation 21 and 22, you find no temple there. In fact, you find the whole city is temple. Because God himself is the temple and the lamb is the temple and believers will be pillars in this temple. That is, believers get the promise of direct access to the presence of God and the lamb forever. God in whom there is no shaking or shifting, solid forever. And then Jesus says, and you will not go out from it. That is significant to the people at the church at Philadelphia. Every time the ground shook, people ran out of doors. In fact, most of the city ran out of the city and lived in tents in the fields to tend their farms. No more going out. A permanent, secure, heavenly dwelling. You don't have to leave. You never have to leave. And then the third part of this security is the name. You will have inscribed the name of God, the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven, and Christ's new name. All of this is a depiction of ownership, rulership, tender love and affection and care. It is the culmination of the great promise of the Bible. I will be their God and they will be my people. You're mine. What better news is there than that, Christian? That you belong to him. That, that he would take our name upon his lips and that he would allow us to take his name inscribed on our foreheads. We who have perpetrated crimes against him, we who by our nature would rebel against him and yet we who by God's grace have been rescued to love him. Oh, that he would be loved by the likes of us? This is too good to be true. And this is the promise of Jesus to faithful believers. This is a contrast to the emperor Domitian. He wanted his name plastered everywhere. Human governments are unstable, unpredictable, selfish. They would write new rules on a whim that would destroy everything you've worked for. That patron who is supposed to see to your welfare doesn't really care about you at all. He's lining his pockets. But Christ gave himself up for you, Christian, at the cross because he loves you. Even the, those who had rejected the gospel, when they hear the gospel and believe the gospel and they come and they attach themselves to the people of God, they say, yes, God loved you. Little ones, insignificant ones, bold, courageous, powerful ones. 
there is a command in verse 11. It is very simple. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so no one will take your crown. The command, hold fast. Grip it tight by faith. The incentive, I'm coming quickly. That's not a reference to Jesus' eschatological coming to the earth in judgment in Revelation 19. That is a reference like the other imminent return promises of Jesus that he could come at any time for the faithful. It is near. It's right around the corner. We don't know the day or the hour. We don't predict dates, but we look forward to it and we look up each day. Jesus, could it be today? Come quickly. That's Jesus' incentive. And then he says, let no one take your crown. The crown here is, is not the regal crown made of gold with all the ornate gems. This is the athlete's crown, the victor's crown. It, it's made of worthless materials. It's a, a laurel wreath. It's made out of plants. The crown is not valuable itself, but it is an emblem of victory. It, and it's worth holding on to because of the victory that Jesus secured. If someone were to steal an athletic crown, what do they get? <laughs> Something that wilts. I mean, it's no good to them. A thief that comes and, and steals your crown, it, it is just out of spite. That is exactly the kind of thievery and robbery that Satan is about. He, he wants to steal joy and victory and life. He gets nothing out of it himself, only hatred and murder. Christian, hold on to what you have. Don't let anybody take away from you. And in this promise and in this encouragement simultaneously, we see how a Christian's persevering and Christ's preservation go together. You hang on, and he keeps you, and you will overcome. The plea is in verse 13. This is application for all faithful believers. Hold fast, keep his word. Don't deny Jesus' name. Don't soften the message to accommodate culture. Listen, the tribulation is not for you, but suffering, trouble, testing in this life are. Pass the test now, skip the final. And Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is for us. Let me give us just a little encouragement this morning. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. This is right. This captures the very heart of God. He loves those who are allied in enmity against him. He gives gracious rain and helpful sunshine to the wicked, to the unbelieving, as well as to the righteous. And so be like your Father in heaven. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. How do we love our enemies and what should we pray? Gospel, gospel. Pray that God would relinquish his wrath overhanging their rebellions and make them trophies of his grace. That he would turn their hostility, melt their hearts, and make them objects of his mercy. Do you ever think about what you're doing when you share the gospel? Maybe you knock on doors in the neighborhood Maybe downtown Phoenix or Mill Avenue or downtown Gilbert, you try to stir up a conversation, maybe in your workplace, and, and you're trying to appeal to somebody to freely access that which came at infinite cost to Christ, which will give them everything because God loves sinners. And when they reject, and when they stiff arm such good news, Rejoice and pray with a burdened heart. Plead with God to rescue them, even as God rescued you. How many times did you stiff arm the gospel before God turned on the lights? And think about this, Christian. The people who despise you or mistreat you the most in life probably get closest to that synagogue of Satan in Philadelphia to those believers. And what did God do with those most hostile? Brought them to Philadelphian believers' feet. We want to worship your God. So pray for your enemies. What might God do? Very briefly, is it okay to buttress the walls of our crumbling culture? 
sure. Put up beams and poles, try to build new walls. But just know this, Christian, those walls will come down again. And this is not our home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your kindness to us. Again, to give us these letters, windows into our own hearts, windows into real churches a couple thousand years ago. God, we pray that we would be those who look forward to your arrival, who ask every day, could it be today that you would take us home? We ask not to escape those trials and tribulations that you intend for us in this life, to make the gospel known to a hurting and needy world, those things which shape us, those things which make us more like your son and make us humble, dependent, and more effective as witnesses to your truth. But we do thank you that you have not destined us for wrath that will come on the whole world. We thank you that you have promised to rescue your own, and that is a day we look forward to. And in obedience to your word, encourage one another with. We ask for your help in it in Jesus' name. Amen.